Unfortunately, I still haven't finished that mini-documentary I was hoping to have posted about two weeks ago. So instead, here's something that was requested by one of my subscribers back in December, and this seems a good opportunity to fulfill it. Many of my subscribers may be aware I do a segment I call Forgotten Aircraft. These take several forms. There are aircraft that are so obscure that they have been largely forgotten despite their historical significance. There are aircraft that, despite considerable production numbers, have likewise been forgotten. There are aircraft that were so bad they practically deserved to have been forgotten. And there are aircraft that were experimental singletons and never got the attention they deserve. And then there's the Cooley airship, which is in a class all of its own. The Cooley airship is a fascinating story from the days of early aviation. Whether it was a scam, or a genuine effort to take to the air, or the story of a born con man who really attempted to build an advanced flying machine is open to debate. Certainly, it is not a straightforward story. Biographical details of John F. Cooley are rather lacking. He is shown on the left in the accompanying picture, along with his manager-slash-investor, Jacob Goldenson. What information I have is based on a couple of articles online, most notably one by the Rochester Democrat and Chronicle, plus some digging around. Of his early life, all I have been able to determine is that his name first appears in local newspapers in the mid-1890s, with stories of his development of a fantastic airship. It seems likely he was from New York, where he was educated at the Penyan Academy. Some newspapers stated that he was from New York, others labelled him the Wizard of Hornellsville, but it was Rochester, New York, where he settled to construct his new invention and hustle for financing. One of the problems with Cooley's story is the simple unreliability of the source material. The articles I've referenced themselves are referencing much older information from the newspapers, and those were not necessarily the most trustworthy sources of information when it comes to aviation. As an example, very early accounts of the Wright brothers' first flight are entirely fictitious. One headline stated, Flying machine stores three miles in teeth of high wind over sand hills and waves at Kitty Hawk on Carolina coast. The author of that account was not present at the event. So what I've tried to do is weave my way around the stories to pick out what is plausible, although in the process I found myself trying to give him the benefit of the doubt. Supposedly, starting from the early 1880s, John Cooley had been experimenting with kites and gliders. This is not beyond the bounds of possibility, as kites had been around for millennia by this time, and one capable of lifting a person into the air need not be particularly large. Early gliders had been the subject of experiments since the early 1800s, and in fact a man flight took place in 1853, Uh, so again, this is not impossible. Adding possibly to the plausibility is the similarity between some early gliders and kites. For more information on early heavier-than-air flight, See the presentation linked in the description. Unfortunately, the only evidence we have for these early experiments is Cooley's own claims. In July 1895, while displaying a prototype of the airship, he told a Rochester Democrat and Chronicle reporter that he had been working on the model for 12 years, and that he had solved the problem of practical aerial navigation, and his ship could maintain a speed of 200 miles an hour. In early 1896, he announced that he had $800 in subscriptions from Rochester men, and would soon build his flying machine. By 1897, it is claimed that Cooley had built a large model of an airship that reportedly flew. The New York Times reported on his test run as follows. Four strong men kept the boat anchored on ropes. 
the boat was allowed to catch a breeze which struck her amidship and she shot up like a rocket the higher she went the faster her speed until the slack in the rope played out she began to wear out the men holding on to her several of the men gave way after their hands had become badly lacerated this was supposedly in front of hundreds of witnesses the airship had risen to five hundred feet before Cooley's men lost control of the prototype which crashed into a grove of trees another account says it was two hundred feet in an alternate version possibly of the same test but possibly of a different test Cooley claimed that by September of 1897 he had tested his airship design at Windsor Beach on the shores of Lake Ontario, stating that, although it still needed adjustments, it behaved beautifully, remaining several hours in the clouds, anchored by a long rope. One problem is that we have only a very limited description of what it is Cooley was attempting to fly. The best I have come across is that it was a flying boat, 40 feet long and 20 feet wide, with eight canvas wings. Some early aircraft design attempts do have a fuselage resembling a boat. I'm thinking Sir George Cayley's successful gliders of 1849 and 1853, and Gustav Whitehead's powered monoplane from 1901. The latter supposedly flew. Given Cooley's alleged experiments with kites, possibly a sort of double biplane layout attached to that, or even something like Cayley's 1849 glider, the idea of putting multiple wings on an aircraft is one that repeats quite often in early aviation history. However, I emphasize that this is all purely speculation on my part. But so far, we're not actually looking at anything implausible beyond salesman's hyperbole. A 200 mile per hour flying craft simply wasn't possible at the time. On the basis of the claimed successful testing, Cooley attempted to get funding to build a much larger aircraft. His goal was a passenger carrying vehicle that would require a pilot and an engineer and provide seating for between three and five people, depending on which account you read. In addition to that ridiculously high speed, later modified to a still unlikely 125 miles per hour, he claimed it could carry its load a distance of 1,000 miles, though this was later lowered to 500 miles. There are at least two possible designs he had in mind. Both were distinctly unconventional by the aeronautical standards of the time. One, according to a drawing made from memory in 1947, seems to depict a flying wing with a large boat-like fuselage below it. The other is the only one of which there are photographs, and I'll get to that one shortly. So I conclude the flying wing idea is the result of faulty memory. Getting funding for Cooley's project proved difficult. Prior to the Wright brothers' successful flight in 1903, it would have been awkward to get funding for aviation even if the project were plausible, let alone something that seemed positively Jules Verne in inspiration. For the next decade, he lectured, demonstrated scale models of the airship and sought additional financing. Regardless of my scepticism, one account of the flight of the scale model is worth repeating. Apparently its mechanical stability was perfect, with two side planes rocking back into position from all sorts of angles into which the inventor forced it. Cooley himself claimed that a Mycroft is a true airship, and greatly differing from the flying machines of Curtis and others, in that it follows the laws of nature and does not require balancing. I am reminded of the Etrech Tauber, with its wings based on the seed of the Javan cucumber. That aircraft was so stable it had difficulty even turning in flight. Cooley was able to get some financing. Originally his estimate was that the huge machine would cost in the neighborhood of $12,000 and he claimed that he had secured that amount from the backing of a syndicate of New Yorkers who wanted to exploit his invention as a commercial enterprise. 
A construction of what was claimed to be the largest aeroplane in the world began in April 1910 in or near New York City, but was moved to the Baker's Farm area of the Genesee Valley Park because of inducements offered by George W. Aldrich, who manufactured the engines that would power it. In July it was said to be almost complete and would be finished in two weeks. Those two weeks, perhaps inevitably, came and went. And then the money ran out. Probably because of this, Cooley became a frequent figure at Rochester hotels, appearing at large banquets held during the winter of 1910-1911, to delighting guests with demonstrations of a flying model. This resulted in the infusion of further funds, including $4,000 from one Richard Parr of New York City. Altogether, it is estimated $20,000 were invested. On March 10, 1911, the newspapers reported that John F. Cooley had invented and constructed a flying machine capable of making a flight of a thousand miles. His machine was different from all others in that it was fitted with a closed car designed to carry a pilot, an engineer, and three passengers, and fitted with two Rochester-made Aldrich 90-horsepower engines. In early April 1911, Cooley announced the incorporation of the Cooley Aerial Navigation Company with a capitalization of $70,000, and his airship, now christened the Flower City, would be ready for an April 15th trial. Again, that date came and went. In May 1911, it was reported that he needed another $6,000 to finish the project, so he travelled to New York to seek more financing, and was never seen again. John F. Cooley did actually turn up in Norwich, Connecticut in the late 1920s, this time forming the Triumvirate Safety Aircraft Corporation. Attempts to raise funds during the Depression were unsuccessful, and another Cooley dream died. But what of his aircraft? Well, it was built, mostly, and photographs exist of it. It is a most unlikely construction. At 81 feet long and 42 feet wide, it certainly lives up to the claim of the largest aircraft in the world, but anyone even slightly familiar with aeronautics will take one look at it and realize that it was never going to take off. Not like that. Supposedly, it weighed 2,800 pounds, which, given its size and construction of spruce wood, oiled silk, with Irish linen over the wings and tail, seems awfully light. The structure is completely at odds with aircraft of the time and lacks the typical box girder fuselage, nor was it of the stressed skin construction that was being developed. I would guess that it would prove distinctly wobbly. A distinctive not only for the unconventional shape, but for the presence of several portholes down each side, presumably for the passengers, it seems distinctly lacking. There are no wings to speak of. Additionally, there is no provision for the pilot to be able to see where he is going. An internal view shows where, presumably, the pilot was supposed to sit in a position that seems more reminiscent of an ocean-going vessel with its control wheel. The complete lack of forward view is evident. If it can be said to resemble anything vaguely capable of flight, it is the head of a plate-piercing arrow or crossbow bolt attached to the flights from a large dart, but the 1,500 square feet of soaring surface with which it was supposed to be equipped are distinctly absent. Perhaps they were never built. Perhaps the spars protruding from the nose and tail are the beginnings of the wings. As it sits, the only way it could have become airborne was as the gondola for a balloon. On July 22, 1911, The Rochester Democrat and Chronicle reported that the end was near for the greatest airship in the world. It seemed that a Mrs. Anna S. Burns, a grocer to whom Cooley owed $92.72, obtained a writ of attachment on the machine. But by now the ship was slowly crumbling to ruin. It had been guarded by now unemployed employees of Cooley who charged ten cents to view the picturesque craft and look through its inner mysteries. 
It was said that parties of girls went into raptures over it, admiring its two propellers and its huge front and rear planes of oiled silk. Only a few days after the writ was obtained by Mrs. Burns, the John F. Cooley airship came to an ignoble end when it was torn to tatters by the wind, and judgment creditors tried to sell the remains as junk. Thus ended the story of Cooley's remarkable dream. Or was it a huge scam? Was John F. Cooley a crackpot promoter, or did he really believe his ship would fly? Around the turn of the last century, there was a universal fascination with manned flight, and for a time the Cooley airship fit the bill. But others would take the spotlight away from Cooley with their demonstrations of aeroplanes that actually flew. In a rather sad afternote, had Cooley remained in Rochester a little longer, or left a forwarding address, he might have been reunited with his son, one John P. Cooley, Jr. of Monroe, Washington, who, having read of his father in some newspaper on the Pacific coast, was attempting to seek its whereabouts. Apparently they had been out of contact for several years. Uh, so, what do we make of John F. Cooley? It is very tempting to conclude that he was a conman, a charlatan, an unblushing self-promoter, his running away when the money ran out, leaving his debt behind him and his workers unpaid, would seem to support this conclusion. However, one account claims that he was a quiet, retiring individual, seeking no publicity, courting no advertising, and reticent of his plans. This seems at odds with the narrative I've related, but it occurs to me that most of his public persona was presented by the newspapers when they discovered his activities. And furthermore, most of his self-promotion occurs at times when he was seeking funding. This serves to paint him in a potentially different light. Was he an eccentric inventor? Possibly. Was he convinced of the potential success of his invention? Well, he certainly seems to have convinced others. Could his airship have ever flown? It seems his model did, though what it looked like is unknown. We will never know for sure, although I suspect not.